Good evening. You probably saw some footage of the 2012 London Olympic Games. You also were corrupted, probably, by the trash, poison, terror, and propaganda uh, being pushed on you during the commercial breaks. But that's another story. Now, when you watch someone excel at a sport such as Michael Phelps, they do not discuss the race of Michael Phelps. They do not discuss his racial advantages. They do not discuss his cultural advantages. They did not discuss the cultural disadvantage of the young woman wearing a hijab and a full, uh, I don't, a nylon suit when she was doing a race around the track. They do not discuss these things. But they want to suggest, oh, well, it's nice. It is the first time this has happened. How significant. It's always a reference to the first, the most, the winner, last place maybe. They tend to discuss the records and what is most extreme about them. And they have a long history. They like to compare the statistics or the stats or the data. Now, what you as a viewer of the games is supposed to believe is that they are trying to get you to worship the winner. And you are supposed to feel a sense of self-satisfaction when you look at that winner of the Olympic Games and you think to yourself, I have my life, he has his. It's probably not perfect because neither is mine, but I think highly of myself. You're supposed to think that they intend for you to worship the winner, that that's what they're trying to sell to you as entertainment. But this is not the case. They are trying to sell you the data itself. They are trying to sell you math, the system. They are trying to get you to worship the data heads themselves so that you will worship computational ability in the brain. Now, this was not always the case. The Olympic Games have been going on for about well, over a century. And data was not always used to describe the track itself, or the speed, or the moment Michael Phelps hits the bloody wall. That was not what it was about. Listen to this and notice what is being discussed. The names may sound fairly suggestive to you. There are certain games in which tallness is of obvious advantage. It would be absurd to suppose that bambooteds, negritids, or sanids could compete effectively with pseudonids, nilotids, or dinarids at basketball, and equally unreasonable to suggest that the three former taxa should be regarded as inferior on that account. It is much better to say simply that their stature is very much less. The relationship between a physical feature and success in sport is particularly obvious in this case, though it goes without saying that other factors as well are concerned in success at this game. Long legs are unquestionably helpful towards speed in running especially over short distances, and successful sprinters are usually tall. The Japanese population is mainly paleomongolid, and members of this taxon are predominantly of short stature. The outcome can be seen readily enough in the results of the modern Olympic Games. In the whole period since these contests were initiated in 1896 up till 1968, 
The Japanese never won a gold, silver, or bronze medal in any running race, single or relay, for men or women, at any distance whatever, with the exception of the marathon. This is a race of more than 26 miles, in which speed is much less significant than fit endurance. In the 1936 Olympics, Japanese Competitors came in first and third in this race, winning gold and bronze medals, respectively. Both these runners were examined by a competent physical anthropologist and judged to be predominantly Tungid, not Paleomongolid. Members of the Tungid subrace are generally rather short, but they are said to be particularly well suited, both psychically and physically, for this almost superhuman exertion. A Japanese runner won a bronze medal in the marathon in 1964, and another a silver in 1968, but their morphological characters were not studied by physical anthropologists. The Japanese are by no means unsuccessful at sports in which tallness is not important. On the contrary, an analysis of all the recorded results shows that they have won 52 gold medals, 43 silver, and 38 or 39 bronze. Long legs are at least as helpful in high jumping as in running. No Japanese man or woman has ever won a medal for this sport at the Olympic Games. The outstanding champion of the women's high jump has been Yolande Balas of Romania whose record of six foot two and three quarters of an inch in 1964 had never previously been closely approached at these games. The population of Romania is predominantly dinnerid, and the facial features and tall stature with especially long legs characteristic of this subrace are well shown in the photograph. To, f to find someone who might compete successfully against Miss Ballas, the British coaches looked specifically for a long-legged girl. The coach who found the most likely candidate for the task remarked of her, it was not so much the ease of her jumping which impressed me as the length of that leg that was taking her over the heights. He recognized the importance of skill and mental attitude, but put the main emphasis on a purely physical feature. Measured from the instep, the length of her long leg on the inner side was 35 and half an inch. Miss Balas is 36. In 1969, an appeal was made on British television on behalf of the Amateur Athletic Association for large women to come forward for training in the shot put javelin throw and discus throw with a view to possible participation in the Rio Europa Cup competition. British women were said to have been unsuccessful in these sports. It is to be noted that on this occasion the entire emphasis was placed on bulk of body, though of course other qualities in addition would be necessary for success. The significance of corpulence in the shot put is suggested by the photograph reproduced in figure 72b, you don't know about that. In military training, obstacle races are sometimes arranged in the course of which the competitors are required to crawl through large drain pipes. The diameter of the pipes being an arbitrary matter, there is no reason why narrow ones should not be selected, an advantage thereby given to bambutids, negritids, and sanids. Indeed, one could easily make it as impossible for a normal Sudanid or Nordid to win, or even to compete the course, complete the course, excuse me, as it is for one of the pygmy taxa to win the shot put. The arbitrary nature of the tests is obvious. On the occasion of the Olympic Games held in Berlin in 1936, an attempt was made by a German physical anthropologist, W. Klenke, to estimate the proportion of competitors belonging to different ethnic taxa in the Japanese contingent. He recognized that hybridity had occurred in the ancestry of most of them, but in the great majority, the characters of one taxon predominated.
If taxonomic position had been irrelevant in the selection of Olympic competitors, the majority of the contingent would have been Paleomongolid, since members of this taxon form the greater part of the population of Japan. But this was far from being so. Klenke assigned 44% of the Japanese contingent to the Sinid subrace, only 29% to the Paleomongolid, and 15% to the Tungid. 5% were Europids of the Anuid subrace, 1% Polynesids, and the rest of a peculiar type called Jacanid. Probably Europid Mongolid hybrids of indeterminate ancestry, but possibly Synids influenced by unusual hormonal balance. The great numerical predominance of synods existed not only in the contingent as a whole, or in the representative sample studied in detail by Klenke, but also in each lesser group consisting of the persons competing in a particular sport. Klenke attributes this to the fact that synods are powerfully built tall people, while the Peleomongolids and incidentally the Tungids and Anuids as well, are short. He notes that among boxers, synods were particularly predominant in numbers among the heavyweight categories, which was indeed predictable. He, it may be remarked that none of these heavy synods won a medal for boxing, nor did any synod win a medal for running or high jumping. This was presumably because there were too few synods in the whole population of Japan to make it probable that there would be a world champion among them. Very nearly as many of the gymnasts were... Wait, you just get the fucking idea. Do I need to go on? Okay, let me tell you. The elites who are in charge of broadcasting the Olympic Games would like you to believe that national heritage is more important than anything else. The truth is, they'd also like you to believe that the system is more important than the winner himself. They do not discuss racial superiority relative to the particular sport, which of course is arbitrary. You could look at it from any angle. They like to discuss winners and losers according to nations. And this is might this might be something that you think that they're trying to push on you as well. But guess what? That's not what they're doing either. It really is about the track. Watch the tapes again.